So first up, we have got Alistair Donaldson from Graphics Fuzz, Imperial College, London. Um, he's going to talk about metamorphic testing for non-testable systems. Um, so Alistair is a reader at Imperial College, London, and a director of the spin-out company Graphics Fuzz. He has done a lot of work in formal verification, programming languages, and testing. And today we'll talk about his current work using metamorphic testing to validate systems that are traditionally hard to test. So, Alistair. There is your clicker. Sorry, you've got to hold both. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what metamorphic testing is and how you might find it useful in testing so-called non-testable systems. And I'll tell you a bit about Graphics Fuzz, a spin-out company from Imperial that uses metamorphic testing to test GPU drivers. So if you were an OpenGL programmer, you would be able to understand this piece of code, which looks a bit like C code, so maybe you can have a go at understanding it. Anyway, this is a, a piece of code called a fragment shader. Let's get rid of the thing from the right hand side of the screen. Yeah. And uh, if you could move that across to the right, that would be good. So this piece of code is used to render some graphics. And if you look at this code carefully, I wonder if you could answer the question, should it render? I'll just use this. Now do it again, sorry. Should it render this image? So should this code lead to that image being rendered? Well, how could you check this? You could think about every pixel coordinate and work out manually what the value should be. How long will that take? Would you get it right? And actually, it's correct even well-defined here. The answer is it's not, because in OpenGL, we're manipulating floating point numbers, and the spec very generously says that implementations are allowed to perform optimizations that change the order or results of um, operations, even if those optimizations may produce slightly different results relative to unoptimized code. And the nice phrase here is slightly different results. If you're a formal verification person, that's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Slightly different. And slightly different in a loop with a million iterations can become very different. The point here is that OpenGL was an umbrella specification to capture existing GPU designs, and this is a deliberate form of looseness in the specification. But the point is that this programming language, OpenGL, can't have an oracle for compilers. Right? There cannot be a compiler oracle because the language is not precisely defined. And in 1982, Elaine Weyerker coined the term non-testable for systems where either there doesn't exist an oracle or it's theoretically possible but practically too difficult to construct an oracle. And I would argue that things like operating systems, hypervisors, machine learning algorithms, compilers are examples of non-testable systems, especially in the case of compilers for loosely defined programming languages like OpenGL, or for really complicated programming languages like C++, where there is a specification, but it's in a book that thick, and it's just written in prose, albeit carefully constructed prose, not super formal prose. So metamorphic testing is a technique that was proposed in the 90s for overcoming the test oracle problem by using known properties of an input domain. It's a very simple technique. I won't formally define it here. I'll just give you an example. Let's suppose you were trying to implement the mathematical sine function. So come up with a function sine that on floating point numbers or on some finite re number representation computes the sine function correct to 100 decimal places. So if you give your function 1.234 as an input, what output should it return? Well, if you don't have an oracle for sign, you don't know the answer to that question a priori. You could try and work it out manually, or you could use another implementation as a reference, but that implementation might itself be wrong. So you don't have an oracle a priori. But we know a few things. We know the claim about this function. It's going to compute things correctly to 100 significant figures. And we also know quite a lot about trigonometry from school, or we should do. Maybe we don't remember. So we know, for example, that sine of x is the same as sine of x plus 2 pi for real numbers for any x. So what we could do is we could try sine of 1.234, and we could try sine of 1.234 plus 2 times pi, and we could ask, are these results the same up to 100 significant figures? And if they're not, then there's a bug in our implementation of sine, right? Because we know from mathematics they should be the same as real numbers, and we know that sine, our implementation, is meant to have this guarantee. Now, of course, if we just say that sine always returns zero, that will satisfy this property. So this isn't something that's going to do verification for you. It's not something that you could use to replace any kind of sanity testing, but it's a way of doing intensive follow-up testing. So if you've got an implementation of a function that's working reasonably well, you can randomly test that function with tons and tons and tons of inputs for which you don't know the right answer by sanity checking get these properties of the input domain. And that's the essence of metamorphic testing. So now let me tell you briefly about how we might apply metamorphic testing to compilers. Let's suppose you've got a program P in a programming language and assume that it's deterministic and well-defined. 
if you compile it, you get an executable E, and if you run that executable on some input, you get an output O. Well, if you could apply a semantics preserving transformation to the program, for example, unroll a loop, or wrap a piece of code in if true, or do some sort of transformation to the code that would not change its semantics, then if you compile the resulting program P prime, you'll get a different executable E prime, because we've changed the syntax of this program, we'll get different object code generated. But if we really have made the transformation be semantics preserving, then if we run the executable on the same input, we should get the same output. And if we don't, then there's a bug in the compiler or the VM or maybe even the underlying hardware. So this is a way of testing compilers, which are fundamentally hard to test because the Oracle problem is really difficult for them. And if we're working in a fuzzy domain, like that of OpenGL, then we might have to do some kind of fuzzy equivalence check between the outputs, O and O prime. But actually, if the fuzziness is between different compilers, not within a compiler, we may even be able to do a precise match because it might be that discrepancies are between different implementations of the language. But if we're testing one implementation, we don't have discrepancies within that implementation. Okay, so what we've been doing at Imperial is some research into how to apply metamorphic compiler testing to graphics compilers, which are one of the most complicated components of graphics drivers. And it's worked pretty well, and we've done a spin-out company called Graphics Fuzz, which spun out in February, and we're working hard on now, selling our test suites to the main GPU vendors. And I wonder if you've got a phone or laptop, if you might actually get it out now, instead of listening to my talk, uh, or you could get this out after. I'll leave the URL up at the end. And head to our webpage, and if you want to have a, a, a visual indication of what we're doing, then click on demo that's at the top of our web page. And what this demo will do is it will essentially run a bunch of pairs of shader programs on your device. If your device supports WebGL, it will run an original shader that should give an image and a semantically equivalent shader that should give the same image or an incredibly similar image when looked at visually. And it will report cases where either you get um, crashes, linker errors, or discrepancies in the images that are reported, and it will ask you as a human to decide whether you think that those discrepancies are visually distinguishable or not. And if, if you don't, then we'll class that as a compiler bug. And at the end, the demo will give your device a score, and if you'd be so kind as to tweet your findings, that would be, that would be great. All right, so let me tell you a bit about what we do in this approach. We take an original shader program, that's the program that's gonna run on the GPU to produce a frame, which is like a kernel, if you're familiar with Qdo or OpenCL. And if we push that through the graphics pipeline, we would get some image out. That image may or may not be correct. As I said before, there's not really a proper notion of correct in this domain, but we would get an image. If we then apply a whole lot of semantics preserving transformations to the original shader, we can get a stack of so-called variant shaders. These are very syntactically different from the reference, but they should have the same semantics. And therefore, when we push them through the graphics pipeline, we should get a stack of images, one per variant, and those images should either be identical to the reference or identical up to floating point Randolph error, so very similar. And we can use some simple computer vision algorithms to check whether the images are drastically different versus just a tiny bit different. So we should get the same images coming out for all of these shaders, but if instead we get a wrong image, like a black image, when we should have got this pretty image of squares at the top, or some problem like our machine blue screening, which does actually happen because graphics drivers really run close to the kernel, then we know there's a bug in the graphics stack. It could be in the compiler driver or the hardware itself. So then what we do is, is we present this mutated program to a compiler engineer, and we say to them, there's a bug in your compiler, trust me, and good luck. And they say, go away, right? Because there's probably a bug in this program. It's probably not semantics preserving, or they don't believe me, okay? So this really isn't very, very useful on its own. What we also need is test case reduction. What we've done is we've made a variant shader that triggered a bug by applying a load of transformations to an original shader. And luckily, because we applied the transformations, we know what they are and we know how to undo them. So what we can do is we can iteratively remove transformations using a kind of guided random search, a bit like, a, I think of it being a little bit like binary search in the sense that you go greedy and you try and like have exponential decay and how quickly you converge to a result. So you do this iterative search, removing transformations while there's a diff or a crash Every time you get the right result, you put back the transformations you undid and you undo some different ones. And you converge on a very small diff from the original shader that preserves semantics, but gives um, a different result, gives a, gives a bug. And this provides, for a developer of the compiler, a path through the graphics driver and compiler that deviates from the, the reference path in a way that should give a good head start in how to debug the problem. So let me show you a couple of bugs we found. This is a bug in an AMD Vulkan driver. Vulkan is a successor programming model to OpenGL. There was a statement that said, return default color. 
And we applied loads of transformations to the shader in all kinds of places, got a massive program that gave this wrong image when it should have given this nice image. And then our tool chain automatically reduced these transformations, reversed them, reversed them, reversed them, until eventually this line of code was replaced with switch zero, and in the case of zero, return default color, break. And I hope you'd all agree, even if you don't program in C, you can probably see that this is a semantics preserving transformation. All right, we're saying if zero equals zero, return default color instead of return default color. And this, this triggers the bug. May not look like something a human would write, but the point is that it's just gonna make a control flow graph inside the compiler that triggers an edge case of an optimization. And there may be many other ways to get that control flow graph or something similar to it that would trigger the same bug. Here's a little example from an NVIDIA Vulkan driver. Here we had total D being assigned to max distance. And what we've done again is we've applied tons of transformations in a randomized manner to the shader. And we've done this to many other shaders too. And we've run them all and we find one that gave a wrong image and we've reduced it down. And then the end result, the fixed point we reach is if glfragcore.x is less than one, minus 100, do nothing, otherwise do this assignment. And if you know about OpenGL, frag coordinate is the coordinates of the pixel and the X coordinate can't be negative. So this condition is equivalent to false, could actually be blasted away by the compiler as it happens. And maybe it was attempted to be blasted away and maybe that's the source of the bug. Who knows, these are black box compilers that we're testing. So this is a small semantics preserving change that's enough to trigger a bug. And for developers of compilers, being presented with a test case in this diff format, here's a shader that gives this image, here's a shader that's obviously equivalent that gives a totally wrong image. That's a pretty nice thing to be presented with as a developer, as much as any bug could be nice to be presented with. Okay, and what we're selling with our company is something called Shader Test. This is a large test suite for OpenGLES, which is the world's most widely used graphics API. It comprises 10 shader families, where each shader is a reference program, plus 300 randomly generated variants. But they're not just the first 300 that the tool randomly generated. We generated loads and loads and loads of shaders, ran them on many devices, weeded out shaders that crash every device because they're just so large, looked for shaders that provided a good coverage, both of OpenGL itself, of the transformations we have at our disposal, that found a range of bugs across the industry. If there was a shader that found a bug in every single device, we looked at the shader and weeded out cases where it turned out that there was a problem with the shader and you know, fixed bugs in our tool chain in the process and curated this large test suite of shaders that are very good at finding bugs. And this is really nice because it allows you to test a graphics driver against other drivers and against itself. What this grid is showing here is a reference column, and there would be 300 variant columns. I've just shown a selection of them here. And down here, we've got different devices, like a Google Nexus player, a Google Pixel 2, Pixel 1, a Galaxy S8 with a Qualcomm GPU, a Galaxy S8 with an ARM GPU, a couple of NVIDIA Shield devices. So these are a number of Android devices that you can go out and buy, and we did go out and buy. And then we've run tests across all of them. And what we should see is this image everywhere. Right? We might see tiny changes in the colors of the image that would be probably be imperceptible. We should just see a very boring grid of this image everywhere. But what we instead see is that, for example, here, 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 we see this different image that's evidently wrong. And actually, the Pixel 2, Pixel 1, and Galaxy S8 US model, they all have Qualcomm GPUs. So this is very likely a bug in Qualcomm's GPU driver. You can see here, for example, that the Imagination Technologies GPU driver has very likely got a bug because the Nexus player has got an Imagination GPU, whereas the other devices here don't. And we can see also we've got things like link errors, crashes, a comp compilation timeout, which is maybe not that interesting because, like I said, we generate really bloated programs. We wouldn't expect them to compile quickly. We don't really care whether they compile quickly. But nevertheless, NVIDIA might like to have a look and see why their compiler is so much slower than, um, than the compilers here or why it's not crashing like the other compilers, perhaps. So that's a quick overview of what we're doing at Graphics Fuzz. And in summary, I think non-testable systems are really interest, interesting. And if you come from a formal verification background like me, you typically want systems where you can precisely write down the property to be checked. And sometimes that's just not possible. It, for compilers, for clean programming languages or cleaned up programming languages, it can be possible. But for full-blown compilers or for compilers for languages that are somewhat loose, this is difficult. I think the Oracle problem is really hard in domains driven by machine learning, for example. There's a lot of interest in how do we even specify what we want from these systems. We know kind of what we want, but we can't formally state it. Metamorphic testing is basically 
just a matter of saying, well, I know a lot of sanity properties of this system. I know that for these two inputs that are related in a certain way, the output of the system should obey a certain relationship. And you can do very intensive testing using those metamorphic relations. You may even be able to do a degree of formal verification using a metamorphic relation as a specification. So it's a substitute for a test oracle in domains where testing is fundamentally difficult and can provide value in finding bugs. And what we've been doing in Graphics Fuzz is applying this to the testing of compilers for the OpenGL programming model, specifically focusing in on OpenGL ES on Android devices. Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you today, and I would love it if you could try the demo, and I'd also love it if you have got any questions for me in the remaining time. Thanks very much. Thank you. So first of all, I tried the demo, it didn't work on my phone. So. Is that, have you got an iPhone? Yeah. yeah. Didn't work on the Mac, okay. Did you try it in Chrome? Okay, so, yeah, the trouble is that... Okay, yeah. So, uh, Apple actually just announced that they're deprecating OpenGL ES in favor of Metal, which is their proprietary programming model. I think maybe we should call them Microsoft, not Apple. Um, uh, actually, on Macs, if you use Chrome or Firefox, then they do support WebGL too, but iPhone, even on Chrome, Firefox, they don't. Anyway, did you have another question? So my question was, how many transformations does this thing apply? In, so, 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 yeah. So what I'm going with that is with the test reduction, you talk about yeah. the uh, kind of search, but what if it's actually a complex interaction of you know, multiple transformations that you apply? That yeah, that's a great question. So what we do is, we've got about 10 categories of transformations we apply, but we apply them recursively, and we can end up we can end up blowing up like a one kilobyte shader file up to 200 or 500 kilobytes. So we can make the file really large, and in the process, be applying thousands of transformations. And what I've learned about fuzzing, randomized testing, is essentially it's good just to try everything. It's good to try a diverse range of strategies. So our tool has got heuristics that it's got parameters to guide how big the program should be bloated, how many transformations should be applied. But those heuristics are not fixed. They are randomly populated on each generation within some parameters. So we do end up with big shaders, and we do indeed end up with cases where you do need some combination of features to get um, a bug. Usually that's the case of a crash. Sometimes it can be that for this compiler to crash, you just need the shader to be sufficiently large, and there can be many ways of transforming it to make it, make it so large, and in that case, the reduction doesn't work very well because you end up getting down to the point where making it much smaller will stop it crashing, but there are billions of ways you can make it slightly smaller, right? maybe not billions, but there are many, many ways, and then the reduction doesn't work so well. What we tend to find for wrong code bugs is, usually it is one transformation or the interaction of a couple of transformations that causes the bug. Yeah. Yes, please. Thanks, okay, so, yeah, the kind of transformations we're applying, well, what we do is we, first of all, inject into a shader some data that we are gonna give runtime values, like zero and one, but such that the compiler doesn't know what those values are gonna be. And that lets us, that lets us construct things like zero, one, true, and false in opaque ways that the compiler can't optimize away. And then the sorts of transformations we do are inject code from another shader in an if-false block, but the false is opaque. We inject code from another shader that will really run, but we use clever tricks to make sure that that would corrupt what would have been originally computed. We wrap a piece of code in a loop that will go around exactly one iteration, but in a way that's opaque to the compiler. We add zero or multiply by one or XOR with some value. Yeah, we, we've got lots of identities we apply. We pack things in structures, pack things in vectors. So we have got a whole load of transformations that we came up with. And I guess your question was why those ones and what makes a good transformation? And that's a question that people always ask because it's a great question, but uh, there is no proper, answer. well, essentially what some people ask more in an academic context is, how do you know that these transformations are some of the right ones? How do you know you're getting good coverage? How do you know you're finding all the bugs? And the answer is, it's testing we don't. But what we do know is that they work and they find bugs. What I can say though is that, from various works I've done related to the testing of compilers and from working in compiler companies myself, things that can be difficult for compilers are struct packing, alignment padding, that's often the cause of bugs. And the other thing is that many algorithms operating on control flow graphs suffer from irregularities in the control flow graph. So things like injecting breaks or continues in a dead context so they won't be reached will change the static control flow graph of a program which can give optimizations a harder time. So that's, for example, gives you some intuition for some of the transformations we apply. But when we've talk, gone and talked to, GP, talked to GP vendors, some of them have generously said, 
said, oh, you should try this or you should try that because they've got some insights into what would trip up their compiler. Yeah. Cool. That's All right. Thanks very much. much. Thank you for that. That was really good.